first time, Robert Waltersdorf, the Susan E. Lynch Executive Director of the Bruce Museum. Um, been here about a year and a half. Uh, you know, it, it's the year anniversary of the beginning of the pandemic. I was here eight months before the pandemic and a year since it began and we've survived so far, haven't we? Um, by the way, you are all here because you're Robert Bruce Circle members. So I wanna say thank you for your support and for your engagement, your participation in the Bruce Museum. It makes a big difference. We're so grateful for that. Um, and I'm just totally thrilled about tonight's event. Um, again, I just met James um, on the Zoom call, but I've known about him for a while. We discovered a mutual friend, um, uh, t t told each other that we should know about the other. Um, but I especially discovered him through the show at the Yale University Art Gallery, which just closed February 28th. Um, I saw it last year. It opened in, what was it, January? I guess February and was open, James said, three weeks before the pandemic closure. Um, I saw it then, it then. It was called James Prosec Art Artifact Artifice. Um, it was just the coolest show I've ever seen, um, where he went and he mined the collections of not only the Yale University Art Gallery, and I believe the Center for British Art, but also the Peabody Museum, which is Yale's Museum of uh, Anthropology and Biology. And, um, you know, it was so in effect, the, the exhibition itself was this complex work of art where James brought things in from different museums and put them together in surprising juxtapositions. and. Um, there were biological scientific specimens along with artworks like a uh, Helen Frankenthaler painting um, and some of his own uh, exquisite watercolors worked in. Um, I have to say one of the coolest um, of all was a giant spectrum of birds made entire, sorry, a color spectrum made entirely of bird specimens from the Peabody Museum. Um, in my mind, it was a model exhibition of art and science. So I'd love to have James do something at the quintessential museum of art and science, the Bruce Museum sometime. Um, so let me see if you didn't have a chance to see that show and most people didn't because it was hardly open because of the pandemic. There's a really great catalog art artifact, art artifact artifice, which you can get on Amazon published through Yale University Art Gallery. I'm guessing you can buy it there too when they reopen. Um, James also did curate another recent exhibition drawn from you know, multiple collections brought to one place, um, made in Connecticut celebrating 25 years of the Connecticut Art Trail that was at the Wadsworth Athenaeum and we were a lender to that exhibition, um, another cool one. Okay, so uh, some small items of housekeeping and then I'll move on to the introduction. So we invite you to ask questions. This is, by the way, a studio tour with James. Um, so why don't you enter your questions through the chat window at the bottom of your screen? Um, we won't lose track of them. They'll be waiting there for the Q&A session at the end. And our curator of science, the Bruce Museum's curator of science, Dr. Daniel Sepka, I think all of you know him by now. He's going to be curating and managing the questions at the end and keep entering questions through the chat as, as it goes forward. Okay, now I want to introduce, not James, but I'm going to introduce Lily Downing, who's um, a near dear friend of the Bruce Museum. Um, she's involved in the Bruce right now in so many ways. She was one of the organizers of the junior art competition last year. And for a few years running, she's been involved in organizing the art auction part of the gala. And she's doing that again this year. Lily, thank you for all you do. Um, and you're going to introduce James and maybe you'll tell us how you know each other. Thanks, Robert. Oh, you're welcome. Welcome. So good, ev good evening to everyone on Zoom. Um, I'm particularly gratified to bring James Prozek to the Bruce today. As you know, the Bruce's charter is art and science, and James is all about art and science. He has portrayed species of fish and animals not only through words, but he has captured them beautifully and accurately in watercolor and various other mediums. James's books have earned critical acclaim including the New York Times, and his art is now in museums and private collections throughout the world. I first met James when he was a senior at Yale and, was, and I was the director of Gerald Peters Gallery. He had just published his first book, Trout, an Illustrated History, and we thought his watercolors would make an amazing exhibition. This, his first solo show in New York, was an astounding success. The watercolors depicted images of species and subspecies of trout throughout North America, including James and my favorite fish, the brook trout or brookie. I spent many a childhood morning fishing for brookies using a small gold safety pin fashioned as a hook and it worked. And James and I discussed 
fish our, our childhood fishing for brookies throughout he in Connecticut and me in Vermont and it sort of fat it sort of became a bond between the two of us. James has written 11 books including Joe and Me, An Education of Fishing and Friendship, Trout of the World, Early Love and Brook Trout, Ocean Fishes, Eels and Exploration from New Zealand to Sargasso of the World's Most Mysterious Fish. Fly Fishing, the 41st, from Connecticut to Mongolia and Home Again, A Fisherman's Odyssey. And most recently, he pu published the catalog regarding the exhibition that Robert just talked about, James Prozac, Art, Artifact, and Artifice. Um, He's exhibited galleries and museums throughout the world, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the National Academy of Sciences, Asia Society, Hong Kong Center, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Addison Gallery of American Art, among others. He has also shown locally at the Yale University Art Gallery, as Robert just mentioned, the Florence Griswold Museum, the Yale Center for British Art, New Britain Museum of American Art, and the Aldridge Contemporary Art Muse Museum. So with that, I'm proud to introduce my friend, James Prozac, to the Bruce Museum. Thank you, Robert and Lily, for those beautiful introductions. I'm honored to be here speaking with you all. Um, and uh, I'm excited to come see you guys in person sometime at the Bruce. And hopefully, uh, you guys can come visit me in my studio in person sometime. So we can extend this, if you wish. <laughs> Uh, post uh, vaccine rollout completion. Um, I uh, usually like to talk for more than half an hour. <laughs> it takes me a while to get rolling, but I will do my best to keep this um, relatively brief. It's 540-ish, so that's 15, 610, I would try to wrap it up. Um, <laughs> so I am, uh, currently, uh, because this is a um, studio visit, I thought I should be in my studio and I'll walk you guys around. The floor is like a giant desk for me. Um, you can see there's lots of papers and things. Every piece of paper is either an idea or a pile of papers is kind of a, a project. Um, so uh, I, I know where everything is. It looks like chaos, but that's sort of my form of order, at least uh, where I am right now. And uh, so I thought I would share maybe um, a few images related to, I guess, my lifetime body of work, but uh, slightly more specifically, some of the themes of the Yale exhibition. And then, uh, yeah, walk around a little bit and then we can we can all chat together, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to share my screen and show a couple images. Uh, um, I live in uh, Easton, Connecticut, which is uh, east of you guys. And I grew up on the street where I live. I, I live two houses down from the house where I grew up, so I have a very strong sense of place. And um, I'm just gonna give a little of my background of this place and, and some thoughts about boundaries and artifice. And uh, because this, this place where I live has really um, obviously uh, influenced my, my life and my thoughts and my work uh, immensely. So the, the street that I live in, uh, live on uh, dead ends on a drinking water reservoir. We're all familiar with reservoirs in Connecticut because we, some of us get our water from them. We get our water from a, a well because we're above the reservoir and not in the sort of flow, downstream flow of where the, the drinking water goes. But um, my street, uh, it's called Ketchell Street in Easton, dead ends on, um, the Easton Reservoir it used to continue into the center of the town of Easton. Um, uh, but then when they built the dam in the 1920s, it sort of cut off this street from the rest of town. So as a kid, when I walked down the end of the street, I'd encounter these no trespassing signs. 
public water supply, the old sign said no hunting, trapping, or fishing. And then about 35 years ago, they changed them to no hunting, swimming, or fishing, because uh, nobody remember what trapping even was anymore. <laughs> But I knew some old Yankees who grew up trapping muskrats and stuff and actually selling them and making money um, in school. But so I was interested in the local history, but um, this, this kind of invisible boundary between what was public and what was private uh, had a, a huge effect on me. Uh, and, um, and I would say that, that this, this particular sign in this tree have become kind of a metaphor al allegory for me about, um, about just boundaries in general in that we draw in nature that are artificial. So if I had to sort of wrap up the theme of my life's work in a couple sentences, uh, one of my main kind of lifelong interests is about how and why we name and order nature what happens when we put words onto a world that doesn't have words on it. We sort of just, I think a lot of us, including myself, think that there's sort of a direct correspondence between names and things, but it's actually couldn't be further from the truth, especially for people who sort of try to name and classify the animals that live on the planet. <laughs> so my kind of central thesis is that nature is this interconnected, constantly changing system. But in order to communicate this holistic continuum or spectrum, uh, you know, we're all evolved from common ancestors going back several hundreds of millions of years. Um, so we're related to every other organism on the planet on this evolutionary timeline. But also in, in the present day, we're interacting with everything else in this uh, kind of ecosystem system or whatever word you might want to call it. And we're affecting other organisms just by breathing, just by, by being here. So, um, so humans, however, in order to communicate, have to take that continuum and draw lines in it and label the pieces. So we can have things like species that we talk about. And there are obviously differences between un different units of biodiversity. A, a bird is different than a tree, is different than a, a fish. But at the same time, they're all really part of the same um, kind of living organism or continuum. So uh, I'm interested in what happens, though, when we do draw lines between things and name them and label them. Uh, for better or worse, when we draw lines or walls or boundaries, uh, we often come to defend those lines and, um, and have trouble seeing beyond them. So this extends into a lot of our a different um, current social or always existing uh, kind of just the issues we deal with every day, whether they're lines between what we call races or gender identity lines or uh, what we call ourselves on our business cards. Um, these are all uh, labels that affect how the world perceives us and how the world treats us. So um, this line um, between what was public and private, uh, you know, again, became a metaphor for me because, um, and, and all my thoughts about this stuff about naming and ordering nature, because as a kid, I saw animals crossing this invisible boundary, deer and turkey and, and squirrels cross the line. So I thought, why, why can't I? What's, what's stopping me from going down to the reservoir fishing or whatever? And I just thought about, um, you know, that nature, nature doesn't really obey over time the lines that we draw in nature. So this, this tree, I remember, as I mentioned, when they changed these signs probably 35 years ago. Um, so this was a new sign back then. And, and since then, the tree has uh, slowly grown around the sign. And it's starting to, it's also, the sign's also succumbing to, um, oxidation and the words are actually getting kind of obscured by, um, by, by just time passing. And uh, eventually the, the tree will not only cover the sign, but tear it in half. And so it just, just speaks to the ephemerality of, of the boundaries we draw. Um, 
in nature. One of my favorite poems um, uh, by Robert Frost is a famous poem, Mending Wall. Uh, and we have a lot of stone walls in Connecticut, so you can identify with this. <laughs> but uh, in the poem, which you probably know, because it's one of his most famous poems, two neighbors meet along a, co a common property line where there's a stone wall and they, they, they um, mend the walls because rocks can fall off in the winter, winter from frost heaving the ground and things like that. And, um, and so they, they meet along the wall and then at one point, the neighbor asks the other neighbor, maybe in the poet's voice, you know, why are we doing this? What's the point of, of mending this wall? Because we have no livestock, there's nothing to keep in or keep out. Your pine cones aren't going to cross over and steal my apple trees or apples <laughs> from my trees. And the, the old Yankee neighbor says to the, the poet, um, good fences make good neighbors. So it's sort of like a, a non-answer in a, in a proverb um, or an old saying. But the, uh, the, the poem opens, though, something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down. So nature nature's always sort of we need boundaries in order to communicate, in order to have tension and friction, but eventually all these boundaries are ephemeral. Um, but the irony of the, the wall in the poem is we think about walls as things that separate, but the irony is that the wall is the impetus for the two people to gather to have the conversation in the, in the first place. So sometimes walls have their own gravity that can be um, good. So this is, um, this, I could talk for an hour just about the sign, but I'll, I'll move on. Let's see, how do I move to the next image? Space bar? Nope. Hmm. Oh, there it is. So I, um, I'm going to pull up the shade here a little. As I said, I grew up in, in uh, Easton, Connecticut, and, and my father int introduced me to nature when I was a little kid. Uh, through his love of birds. He grew up in Brazil and fell in love with birds as a child down there. And, um, and he wasn't afraid to pick up like a dead bird and put it in my hands. And, uh, you know, these were the things that really influenced me as a kid. Uh, the, the tact, not just the visual experience of seeing a bird, but the tactile qualities of the bird, the how soft and light it is. And by this point, uh, maybe I was six or seven years old. I was already copying Audubon's paintings of the birds of North America and, and, and drawings from Roger Torrey Peterson's Field Guide to the Birds. Peterson lived in Old Lyme, Connecticut, by the way. <laughs> um, and really, his field guides revolutionized how we look at nature and treat it and, and really helped start the ecotourism uh, movement. But, um, but it wasn't just for me about seeing nature, but having a direct tactile relationship with nature. And for me, drawing was the primary way that I found I could get closest to nature. Somehow um, it helped me forge this intimacy with the natural world in a way that talking about it couldn't, writing about it in my journal couldn't. Um, it, and I, I've been puzzling over this um, for a good part of my life. And that's, that's kind of where the, the, um, the artifice part of the discussion comes in. Um, artifice in this sense being any, any time that we try to represent nature um, in a medium that isn't what it's made of. So a drawing is in a sense, uh, kind of a, a visual trickery where you're trying to create an image of a two-dimensional, of a three-dimensional object and a two-dimensional surface, or a duck decoy, or a fishing fly, or, or a bust of a, of a, of a human uh, made of marble. Um, but humans aren't the only creatures that, that do this, this kind of imitation or mimicry or representation. And I'll show some images of other examples of this, but um, as Daniel and, and biologists know, and, and most of us know, um, nature imitates organisms, and nature can come to imitate other organisms over long periods of time. Uh, we call it mimicry or biomimicry. A caterpillar may develop a, a, um, 
a sort of rear end that looks like a, a venomous snake so that um, predators don't grab it or, um, or a, a bird may lay an egg that has a pattern on it that looks like the, the, the sort of substrate that they're laying the egg on, whether they're beach stones or whatever. So this kind of um, creation of a secondary world through representation is something that we in part call art, but it's, I believe, something that's been very important to our uh, survival. Um, again, through drawing a way of forging a more intimate relationship with nature, but in a way drawing nature closer to us. So if you think of a fishing fly or a decoy, they, they trick an animal into thinking that it's an actual thing. And then they come close enough that we can trap, um, capture it and potentially kill it and eat it. Um, but drawing, um, I believe had also enormous survival value from the first time we made marks on cave walls not just in creating a secondary nature that we could use to communicate it, because those drawings not only communicated things, but they also evolved into our written languages. Those, those drawings of bison and things evolved into hieroglyphs and pictographs. And then our abstract alphabets that, that come to represent sounds instead of things. And um, even our words, our spoken words, in a sense, of, are representations of things. So all these things are always swimming around in my head and I try to make sense of them. <laughs> I'll try to show a few images. This is just an early drawing of a, a warbler, probably five years old or something. And then as um, Lily mentioned, I had this sort of long, intense passion for drawing these fish called trout. And I don't know where it came from. I don't know why any of us fall in love with things in nature. E.O. Wilson called it biophilia. We can try to justify it in different ways, but I think it's just part of being part of the natural world and, and, and thinking, breathing animals. Uh, but again, when I was making these drawings, I was never really thinking about why I was making them. It's only more recently that I've, I've tried to puzzle through, not, not necessarily why humans began drawing, to begin with, but why we continued to draw, because in order for us to continue drawing, um, and, the, and as we know, the materials and the, the tools that we use as um, uh, to make art today uh, are still very primitive. Like, how is it that, that a pencil, you know, is still a relevant tool for making a mark or, or a paintbrush, which is you know, animal hair tied to a, a, a wooden stick. I mean, the, these tools haven't changed for thousands of years. My father was a, um, a started his career in the merchant marine and sailed around the world on, on cargo ships. And then when he retired or stopped sailing, he became a, uh, a teacher who taught about astronomy in Trumbull, Connecticut schools, because they had a planetarium and he knew a lot about celestial navigation. Uh, but he also taught earth science and biology and he was just always very science-minded and evolution was always a top conversation at dinner. He was reading these popular evolutionary biologists like Stephen Jay Gould and Neil Wilson. And it, it was always kind of like asking, why do we do this? Or what's the evolutionary value in this? So that's probably why I'm, I'm probing and asking these questions. Um, to me, art and science are part of the same thing. They're just about humans making observations in the world the value of art is that, as opposed to science, they both have their merits, of course, um, is that artists sort of can, can delve into the realm of experience without needing to have a reason <laughs> or not needing to, um, to stick to kind of a, a way of collecting data in a systematic way. So I I, I'm science minded, but I preferred art as my form of expression because science can't really delve that well into uh, the, the realm of personal experience, which is something that I um, was really interested in. So here's another painting of a, once I did the first, the first book I did of the Trout of North America came out in 1996 when I was about 20 years old. I started it when I was about 10 years old. Um, 
because I love these fish and I went to a local library, this is before the internet, and looked for a book on the trout of North America, equivalent to what Audubon had done for birds or Peterson for birds. And um, I couldn't find one. So I started writing letters to departments of wildlife around the country asking, you know, what kind of trout live in Nevada or Wyoming or these different places with mountains and cold streams or Maine or New Hampshire or Vermont. Um, and uh, I got really nice responses from these different biologists who study particular fish their entire lives, different kinds of trout in remote places in the desert and Baja Peninsula or wherever, and developed this network of people who study these fish. And I, of course, in order to do a book, wanted to come up with a list of all the trout in North America, but that actually proved to be very difficult because none of these biologists could actually agree on how many species of trout there were not only that, they couldn't really agree on what a species even was. Um, it turns out there's about 25 working definitions of what a species is. So this is when, at about 12 years old, I started to lose faith in the reliability of names to describe the world. Because when things evolve on a continuum, there's not always a clear place where you can draw a line between this species and that species, because there's this continuum of intermediates between them um, that aren't always uh, ex extinct. So, and trout happen to be a, a type of fish that's very uh, difficult to classify because of the way they evolved. There's a lot of separation and mixing and not actually very different than how human beings evolved. We may have evolved in a different um, sort of local environments uh, where we might have lived as a population for 10,000 years, developed local adaptations like maybe the ability to breathe better at high altitudes. And then at other times, we would move and mix again because the habitat changed. So the human species is a very diverse variable species, but um, you can't really separate us into different groups because we've just continued to mix over the, the tens of thousands of years that we've existed. So. Um, any attempt to do that is, is kind of um, pseudoscience, um, as we know. Uh, so the trout, the trout were a really good excuse for me to make inquiries about the world. They're sort of a lens through which I, I allowed me to sort of have an excuse to travel. After I did the Trout in North America book, I did a book on the trout of Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Um, traveled to places like the headwaters of the Euphrates in eastern Turkey, or this is a, a headwater of the Tigris River near the Iraqi border. Some of these places were politically turbulent and um, maybe a little dangerous <laughs> at the time. Uh, the Kurdish people were fighting the Turkish military in this region of, when we were there. This is a trout from the headwaters of the Tigris. These are little trout char actually from um, a stream in Hokkaido, northern island of Japan. Mongolian rental car. Uh, was a, but, you know, fishing is, was also a good, fishing was the way I collected my specimens <laughs> to paint, but it was a really good way to, to sort of meet people around the world because it's sort of this universal thing. Wherever there's fish, there's people trying to catch them and we would try to communicate them and we made friends everywhere we went and like this little Mongolian boy who just brought us this fish out of nowhere because you could see we're having trouble catching one. <laughs> um, and then I, you know, after painting hundreds of trout, I, I wanted to start thinking more about or expressing more about the thoughts I was having um, instead of making just literal depictions of, of trout, kind of expressing some of my ideas through the work. So the first works I made were kind of these hybrid creatures um, that had almost become their names in protest of us putting names on them, like a parrotfish. Um, they were supposed to resemble kind of pages from a quack naturalist notebook who sort of traveled around the world and just made up stuff, <laughs> or a turtle dove. Um, these were some works that were in the Yale show of birds with um, beaks that had evolved. So these are these are tool creatures, so they evolved to be useful so that we would protect them. The, the duck has a drill bit and the other birds have pencil beaks and fish hooks. And so it's just kind of thinking about how 
humans may affect nature just by thinking about it, by the things we make? What if birds could evolve to mimic human industry in order to survive? This is the kind of one of the sort of examples of artifice that I was playing with in the show. Um, also, you know, humans have imitated the techniques of nature in so many different ways for our benefit. So um, in the show, I juxtapose nests made by birds with baskets made by humans. The object in the upper, upper left is a very old basket from Syria. But there's no question that humans learn how to weave by looking at and watching birds make nests. I mean, birds have been doing it for tens of thousands of years longer than, if not hundreds of thousands or several million years longer than humans. Um, I love the little nest in the lower right um, made by a hummingbird. It's tiny, but it's made of lichen and cobwebs. Um, or a Ruth Asawa with a Indonesian fishing basket or a a Southwest um, indigenous basket. Uh, just, just questioning the lines between what we call art and what we call artifact. These were objects that I put together, as Robert mentioned, from the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale and the Yale University Art Gallery. Um, and then I, I, if we had more time, I would get more deeply into my interest in naming <laughs> um, the biblical story of Genesis is obviously an important one because Adam is the first namer and um, uh, questioning what happens in the Garden of Eden when, when, when names are first put on the animals. So Ursula Le Guin, the science fiction writer who died recently, wrote this beautiful story called She Unnames Them, where Eve goes to the garden unnaming all the animals that Adam named because she felt that once he named them, they stood as like this barrier between us and them. Before their names, there's no separation. And then all of a sudden, when you draw lines between things and label them, you create this world where everything is, is divided and different. So to me, in order to live well on this planet, we have to balance the named world with the unnamed world, the name, the, the world before it was divided into pieces um, and balance that with the world that we have to chop up and label in order to communicate. To me, nature is not a separate, made up of separate units that fit in boxes. It's again, this holistic continuum. Um, just another quick example of, I, because I'm interested in the beauty of nature, I've, I've, I've spent time with scientists, biologists, because they make really interesting inquiries about life on the planet. So I went on an expedition with the Peabody Museum to this little um, former Dutch colony north of Brazil called Suriname. And we helicoptered into the middle of nowhere and collected uh, different animals. And, and I, you know, made, uh, this is a, a sheet that we put up at night and ran a light on a generator to attract moths. Um, this is a, a white witch moth, which has potentially the largest wingspan of any organism on the planet. So it's really about, um, a love of things in nature. And I manifest that love by making um, drawings. If we had more time, I would talk more about all this. But <laughs> uh, the, the work that Robert was talking about was a color spectrum that I made by pinning uh, 222 birds to the wall in a color spectrum. Actually, this is the only work that's still up. And when the museum reopens at Yale, they're planning to keep it up through the summer. So if you do go there, they're gonna um, they're gonna install some of their contemporary and, and modern works around it, but at least that that piece will be up for a little bit longer. Here you can see on the left there's a a South American feather cape made from thousands of macaw feathers that's uh, three or four thousand years old. It's amazing that it uh, survived. But uh, the the point of doing this I don't know how to go back. Oh here. The point of doing this spectrum, and I'll, I guess I'll, maybe I'll show one or two more pictures and then I'll do a quick walk around the studio because I've been talking too much, um, was that again, nature is an undivided continuum, a spectrum. The lines between species are often arbitrary, even Darwin said so. Um, but in a color spectrum, uh, a color like red is not a real thing. We create 
and name that piece. It's a segment of a continuum. There's no place in nature where red ends and orange begins or any, any place between colors. We create those, those lines and we label them. We can, we can label where the line that we've drawn is scientifically or numerically, but um, in reality, a color spectrum is an undivided continuum and uh, as is the evolutionary continuum. So I was sort of conflating these two things uh, by making this work. I guess I'll show I'll show one more thing that these are I did a collage of all the labels, which carry a lot of information, including names. Um, the oldest specimen in the spectrum was a Carolina parakeet collected in 1882 in uh, Tampa, Florida, before they were extinct. Um, this is an egg of a, a long-tailed grackle, which is a bird that lives in Connecticut, and um, I wanted to highlight that humans aren't the only creatures that make marks and that um, make marks that communicate uh, information. So I scanned these eggs in 3D and unrolled them to show and enlarged them to show the beauty of the, these lines. And um, when a female lays a clutch of eggs, these marks, which are made in the oviduct of the bird, um, she deposits these, this sort of ink on the egg as the egg rotates in the body that the, the writing instrument stays um, stationary and, and makes these marks. Um, she can identify her eggs as individuals uh, because each of the marks on every egg are, are individuals. So they, they could be thought of as almost names um, and they resemble the works of different abstract expressionists. So I put stuff like David Smith's and, and uh, Pollock's in the show next to them just to sort of show that, yeah, I mean, a lot of different things I was, I was trying to kind of communicate at the same time, but these artists were trying to make marks that were um, outside of human thought that were not representing anything. And it's kind of interesting that birds make these marks without thinking about them, probably a, a more purely, um, a mark made more pu purely outside of conscious thought than a human can. Um, in any case, and then we get back to the, the cave drawings and asking why, why we drew, why we continue to draw. I love these, these things and, and animals make marks all the time that communicate information. These turkey tracks in the snow are communicating or different bird tracks, which direction the birds are going. And as early hunter gatherers, we read these marks in the sand and the soil and they helped us capture these animals, track them down and kill them and eat them. So we've been reading nature before we had written language. These, these marks are probably one could say the first written languages. This is a bird's um, imprint of a bird taking off in the snow. Um, it shows the residue of, of a movement. Uh, it communicates what happened in the past. It preserves, uh, it preserves, um, uh, it preserves a, um, an experience um, beyond the moment where it was um, made. And uh, when we first made marks consciously, like this handprint on the wall, I feel like that was probably a major revelation. It was almost like we could look back at that handprint and say, I am here. You know, this is a this is an acknowledgement of our self-awareness as humans. We made marks before we made them consciously, obviously, you know, walking in the mud or whatever. But once we could make a mark and reflect on it, that was the beginning of everything, of of, of our written histories of communication and those marks evolved into sort of these, you know, pictographs and hieroglyphs that evolved into our modern uh, alphabets. But I didn't really even get into <laughs> uh, sort of, I'll just end by saying that, you know, I engaged in two significant forms of artifice as a kid. I was not only drawing the trout, but I was making imitations of the things that they ate and throwing them out there to try to trick a trout into eating it through fly fishing. And it, has, it didn't really occur to me until recently that these two things, drawing the fish and making an imitation of the things that they ate with feathers and furs 
fur, we're sort of part of the same activity. Um, both ways of engaging um, an animal, actually getting its attention. If a fish acknowledges that what you made, that you think looks like an insect, if they think it looks like an insect, then your mind, the mind of a human is essentially connecting uh, to the mind of a fish through this, um, this sort of instrument of artifice. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and walk around the, <laughs> the uh, studio quickly, if I can figure out how to stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? Hmm. There, stop share. Can you guys see where I am? <laughs> um, I'll just do this for two minutes and then we can talk a little bit. But this is the field outside of my studio here. And um, this again is my, the upstairs of this, <laughs> the studio. Uh, I live, you know, there are these several fields and then uh, the Eastern Reservoir down there. So it's, it's relatively rural-ish, even though we're, we're close to um, New York here and Greenwich, which Greenwich of course has its own beautiful rural uh, places. But I'm working on these, these images of, snowy owls and um yeah that's that's pretty much it there's more downstairs but i'll uh maybe it's time to kind of open it up to discussion <laughs> i could of course keep going but um that the book robert mentioned uh is that this is the catalog for the, the exhibition at yale and um I wrote quite a bit of material in here if anybody's interested in in these um, these themes or in continuing a discussion about it. So thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks, James. I appreciate the the little tour and, and all the really great images. I was um, just blown away by the unrolled egg with the with the uh, markings just as a square instead of on an egg. I never thought about that before. It's beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Um, yeah, the egg. I I did. I have to give credit to the bird on that one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just, just the way of thinking about it that way, like it was the signature. I think was really um. It it was um pretty cool. I love I love I love that point. Well, that you made. I, there's obviously a lot more. I mean, that there's actually people studying this right now. It, one of Rick Prom's students at Princeton, Cassie Stoddard is studying you know why they make these marks how they're made in the oviduct of the bird in the last hour before they're laid um, how the ink is deposited on the egg um, but also why they do it so if if a female lays a clutch of sh three eggs and she can recognize her eggs as individuals then when a parasitic bird like a cuckoo lays their egg in the nest that is a foreign body she can recognize it and and kick it out before it hatches and appeals to her motherly instincts. Mm -hmm. But um, but the the parasitic birds that don't make their own nests and lay their eggs in other birds' nests have evolved to mimic the patterns on the host birds of the host bird's eggs. So it's this sort of mimicry arms race, <laughs> which is really interesting to me. But but also these birds that lay eggs that look like the stones on uh beaches and um you know to to be camouflaged and they're essentially like a representational painting because they're representing the world that they're um they're kind of being laid on but in another medium wow. right i'd like to think that pollock was walking on the beach in east hampton and saw some of these eggs and he stole it all <laughs> Great. Um, so, so we have um, a question and answer session now. If anyone has any questions for James, you can please um, chat, um, type them into the chat box, and, and I'll be kind of um, curating them, so to speak. Um, so, the first question we have is from Robert Whitby, who asks: um, A piece of your art um, with many birds was displayed in the Yale Art Gallery, along with the Henry Moore sculpture and a dinosaur head. And he was wondering if you can comment on um, the connections between these two very different or three very different objects. <laughs> yeah, uh, for context, I think there's a picture here I could show. Um, yeah, in the lobby uh, of the art gallery, we were able to put a, um, 
the skull of a a torosaurus um dinosaur oh. next to a, next to a, a a sculpture by barbara hepworth and then i did a a mural behind them of these bird silhouettes so the the torosaurus skull is the if not still was at once at one point thought to be the largest skull of any uh land animal ever and uh and it was collected by um uh uh oc marsh who was the founder of the peabody museum and out in wyoming and it just looks so sculptural and and so i <laughs> i thought it looked like a barbara hepworth sculpture so i i looked up barbara hepworth on the the uh the uh, sort of um, collection search and there's just was this perfect one to put next to it just to make this sort of visual uh, connection between the two objects um, but the uh, there's a lot more about why but I I could go on and on and I, I described some of the reasons why in the book but the mural is a uh, made up of bird silhouettes and numbers and the, the sort of source material for these murals I do with bird silhouettes and numbers or, or different animal silhouettes and numbers are the end, end papers of these old field guides where you have silhouettes of creatures and numbers and the numbers match up to a list of names to help us learn how to identify and learn the names of the animals. So I paint the murals and I leave the numbers, but I, there's no key so people can't satisfy their urge to know what the names are and then maybe they're less dependent on uh, language and having an experience about looking at the things and uh, and can just look without needing language as a kind of crutch but that's a short answer <laughs> but yeah then, no, I didn't notice the similarities I think those finestra would close up in triceratops and then things would all be different <laughs> um, but yeah that, that, that looks great um, I love the way they were juxtaposed. Um, we have a question from Kathy Epstein who's asked, um, since color exists only in our perception, what is the function of color in nature? Um, do you know what she means by color only existing in our perception? I, I would assume this may be relating to how we perceive a different part of the um, electromagnetic spectrum, spectrum than um, like insect. Oh, sorry, Kathy can speak for herself. Okay. Is Kathy there? Is Kathy she... there? Do you want to answer? No. Okay, I'm I am here, and actually, it's my more professional um, half who is an ophthalmologist ah. who is asking ah. the question. And do you want to clarify? Oh, just the the cones of the human perceive color. But uh, most creatures don't have those cones. Therefore, color for them doesn't exist. Right. Right. So, so why, how are, does, so why, why is there, are, why is there, not why, but how? Not, it, I, I, I can't, you can't answer why. We don't know why, but you could, I hope you could tell us how color interacts with creatures that don't see color. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I know with the case, well, know with the case can you guys hear me? Maybe if you mute, I'm hearing an echo. If you mute Kathy, if Kathy mutes her thing, maybe it'll go away. Okay, thanks. <laughs> no, I know, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a biologist or an ophthalmologist, but I, one of the other sort of interesting things about the bird spectrum, of course, is that, as you noted, other animals have different um, visual equipment than we do. And this is something actually that Rick Prom, the professor of ornithology at Yale is studying, how do birds see color? And birds actually have the ability to see a whole spectrum of colors that humans can't. They can see ultraviolet colors. So when a bird looks at that bird spectrum, they can see colors that we can't. And those colors are very important in their, um, in their uh, sexual selection um, rituals and stuff because there are markings on their feathers that we can't see. So we actually don't really fully know if you're a, a field biologist studying bird behavior, we'll never really know exactly what a bird's seeing and what they're responding to. But you've seen these dances uh, by, um, you know, probably uh, Birds of Paradise and stuff on, on these nature shows. <laughs> 
they're quite insane and amazing. And, uh, and a lot of them are driven by color um, and displays of color. So I don't know much about animals like I think dogs that don't, that may seem black and white, but I do know that the birds actually can see a broader color range than we can. And um, some of these um, ocean cephalopods or some kind of animal, maybe Daniel knows how, have the ability of seeing more colors even than birds. So um, we, yeah. will, we will never know what the world looks like um, as a bird, but we can know that they see the world differently. Um, so I hope that sort of answers a little bit of your question. Yeah, I think it's mantis shrimps that can see even yeah, they're, they're beautiful rainbow colors and they can see even more rainbow colors <laughs> that we can. So they, they have, um, yeah, a, a remarkable um, visual range. Um, and that, and the color, color, by the way, is a really, sorry, Daniel, yeah. a really wonderful way to talk about art and science together because obviously artists are interested in color and how color can be used. Um, to make visually interesting things and color is something that drives um, the, uh, again, sexual selection and other forms of selection in different animals. Those, those colors on the birds exist because according to Rick, Rick Crum wrote a whole book about this called The Evolution of Beauty. Um, they exist because of individual preferences made by female birds who select the mates the bird that they want to mate with. So if there's a mutation or an anomaly in a male bird of a particular species where you have one individual that's born with a blue patch on its chest and some female birds like, huh, that looks very attractive. I'm going to mate with that bird. Their offspring have a better chance of having that blue patch. And that's how these, these birds get these spectacular colors is through female birds deciding who they want to mate with. Largely, that's one of the main, that's Rick's, you know, that was Darwin's theory of mate selection, but it's also um, something that Rick has been really delving into. Um, and again, I'm an artist, not a biologist. So Daniel can correct me, <laughs> but I'm fascinated by these things because who wouldn't be? I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah birds have really, Done some remarkable things and yeah if you shine a uv light on a penguin you'll see markings on the bills of emperor penguins and all these other species that that we can't see so they they experience the visual world in a way that that we can't and it's um yeah, it's very difficult to visualize what that might be like because we just we don't see in that range um so i have a, a question from laura schrader who asks um with so much to choose from, is there anything that you use as an inspiration or direction to help you determine which species that you might want to um, pick for your next work or series? So I guess there's all of biology <laughs> spread before you. And what, what, why trout or or birds or or taurosaurus and not um, snails or crabs or deer? <laughs> I have no idea. It's it's a great question, but I think it's just. Uh... Our, our arbitrary um, preferences for certain things that, you know, obviously as a kid, I never thought about why I love these fish so much. I think I've, my life, all my life, I've been captivated by things that are colorful as a lot of us are. And trout are very colorful fish. They live in beautiful places. Um, so that was definitely a reason for that. Butterflies, birds, um, and that's, again, part of what Rick's theory is, is that beauty is something that crosses between species boundaries. I mean, what a bird sees is beautiful, a, a human can see is beautiful. Um, we, after all, are not that distantly related from fishes or other organisms on the planet. I mean, 400 million years, it's like not that long ago. <laughs> but so we, but our, our brains are kind of like, structured in a, a relatively similar way. So, you know, we'll never know what beauty means to a bird, but um, some biologists like Rick feel like beauty is a lot of what drives uh, what they do, the preferences they have, the mates they select. Um, so their dances, their calls, their art that they make through selecting mates. You could, you could argue that 
the bird is an art form that was an art object that was made through individual aesthetic choices of, of a female bird over long periods of time. So we owe all those colors to the females, um, not the males. <laughs> Yeah, you can think about different um, periods of when the way people dress at different points in history and see that in humans too, I think, in the past. Um, as a curator of our natural history collection, I just wanted to comment that um, one of your great achievements is that you actually got a ornithology curator to allow you to pin hundreds of birds onto a wall. Um, and I think based on what you're telling us about um, Dr. Rick Brum, he seems to study beauty in birds, and so maybe he was more amenable to most, um, but that's that's wonderful that was able to be um, executed because a lot of museums would say no. <laughs> well, I, I, part of my job is to try to get uh, the holders of these objects to loosen up a little bit because, you know, the Peabody Museum has a collection of 150,000 bird specimens. It's one of the 10 largest collections in the world that were collected over the last 150 years. Nobody even knows they're there. Nobody sees them. They're in drawers, you know, all the time. In order to access them, you need to have a good reason. So it took a lot of lobbying. I mean, years of lobbying to get Rick. And I happen to be really close friends with the collection manager who works under Rick. Christoph Zyskowski. So, but I also, you know, embedded myself in the in the museum. I'm an, I'm a volunteer curator or curatorial affiliate. I've been on expeditions collecting birds for the museum. I actually killed and stuffed and prepared two of the birds in the spectrum, which I'm not, you know, necessarily proud of, but that was part of trips like that trip to Suriname were part of my inquiry into how things get named by people. And if you want to find species that haven't been named yet, you try to go to the most remote places on the planet because if there are no people, there are no names. And there are places that people really have never lived because there's no good reason to live there um, if there's no good resources or if it's the, the, the soil's thin or the, <laughs> the trees go to, the, go to the top of the mountains and there's no water, no streams, you know. So these are places where you know, scientists like to go and look for uh, organisms or units of biodiversity that haven't been named, but. Um, yeah, pushing the frontiers. So I, I think we're up um, at the end time of our event at 6.30. Uh, I, we could probably take one more question if anyone has something profound to add, um, but otherwise we may be ready to wrap up. I, I really appreciate you um, taking us into your studio and sharing all those images with us and. Um, making all those wonderful connections. Um, the Bruce Museum really values the art and science um, connections, and this was a perfect example of that. So I think it's a really great event for us, and um, I hope that we can have you in our museum as an artist one day um, with some of your work on our walls. I think Robert agrees. Um, <laughs> we're looking forward to the new Bruce, and um, we'll be we'll be calling. <laughs> well, I would be honored, and I I really value what you guys are doing, and. It's a great institution and we're really lucky, I mean, to have places like the Bruce in, in our backyards and um, yeah, anything you guys want to do, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> but thank you for everything and, and I, you know, we can continue this conversation obviously at any time too if people have questions and um, or again, you guys are welcome to come in person sometime visit the property <laughs> not that far away excellent all right thanks james thank you everyone for attending and um, we'll see you next time <laughs>